Okay, welcome everyone. Um, let us let us slowly begin. Um, my name is Aleška Greplova and I will be your host and moderator today. Uh, thank you very much for joining us for the long range colloquium that is organized by Virtual Science Forum. Just a quick, a quick introduction about us, if this is your first time joining us. Uh, Virtual Science Forum is an open volunteer run initiative to facilitate online scientific seminars and conferences. If you would like to help this effort, you can join our group, you can organize a session or such as the speaker. For all of the information about this, you can visit our web page. I send the link into the chat. Uh, all our content is available on GitHub and on our YouTube channel. The link to those you should also see in the chat. I will resend it again for the people who are joining just now. We have this colloquium regularly. The next instance will happen on August 19 and the speaker will be Mohamed Hafezi. Uh, let me also thank to our institutional support, uh, in particular to the Kavli Institute of Nanoscience in Delft. Uh, just for the practical aspects of asking questions, we have many attendees, so to structure it a bit, we would ask you to use the raise hand button of the Zoom and I will be monitoring the chat during the talk and try to try to give you give you a word when it's when it's least disruptive, so you will have option to ask questions during the talk and then there will be dedicated time to also ask questions after. Uh, let's move to the today's colloquium. Our speaker is Titus Neupert from University of Zurich. Uh, he is famous for his work on the fractional churn insulators and many nice results in vial physics. Uh, more recently, he's been working on many different things. Some examples are machine learning and condensed matter physics, topological metamaterials, and higher order topological insulators. And today, Titus is going to introduce a new type of topological insulator, the so-called exceptional topological insulator. So with that, let's go ahead with the exceptional talk. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Eliska and the whole team of the virtual uh, of the long range colloquium. Um, it's great uh, to have the opportunity to talk here and uh, thanks everyone for joining. Um, so exceptional topological insulators um, is the, the topic today. It's a, a subject that uh, we've been looking into over a few months now and we've uh, just posted this paper here it's on the archive today. So if you're interested in more depth what uh, I'm going to talk or what I'm talking about, just take a look there. The team um, is uh, consisting of three PhD students that uh, work on this project, uh, Michael Denner, Anastasia Skoratyska, uh, and Frank Schindler, who is not soon not a student anymore because he's just moving to Princeton uh, this month. Then uh, we have Mark Fischer as a senior research assistant in my group, Bonnie Tomale from Würzburg, and Tomasz uh, Pstuszek, who is um, an Ambitioner Fellow at the Pauschale Institute and also affiliated with our group at the University of Zurich. So um, this is, you know, to tell you who I've been having the pleasure to uh, work with. And now for this talk, I have basically uh, the plan to uh, structure it in three parts. Uh, the first one to make this a colloquium and reasonably self-contained will be on uh, topological band theory in a conventional sense for Hermitian systems. I'll just remind you of a few concepts. It's uh, hopefully just a weighted reminder that's not too um, repetitive for, um, for the, those in the know. Uh, then I will um, highlight what changes when we go to non-Hermitian systems which is going to be important for these uh, exceptional topological insulators. And the last third, bit more than last third of the talk is going to be dedicated to the exceptional topological insulators, this uh, phase of matter that is uh, the subject of this talk. 
All right, so let's jump uh, right in uh, to this uh, first part. And uh, this is not meant to be a comprehensive introduction to band uh, topology, but a very spotlighted one. And the first uh, spotlight I want to put on three-dimensional topological insulators, which are bulk insulating crystalline systems. And they are characterized by a surface state that is conducting and uh, topologically protected, and this has been beautifully seen in experiment. So here you see the band structure of a system with a boundary, so the bulk states are gapped in gray, and then on the surface you have the surface states which form actually a single Dirac cone band structure. And uh, this band structure, you can, this surface state, you can predict from just knowing the bulk uh, electronic structure. And it is has two important features. It's protected by symmetry. The symmetry here in, at play is charge conservation and time reversal. And uh, it is in a sense anomalous in that it really relies on having this three-dimensional topological bulk to be realizable in purely two-dimensional systems with time reversal and charge conservation. One would not be able to realize just a single Dirac cone. So that's an important ingredient that I'll highlight again and again. In topological systems, the surface, the boundary has some anomalous feature, like this uh, single Dirac cone here. Second example of a topological state of the uh, churn insulators, which is a different word for integer quantum Hall effect that doesn't require an external magnetic field to be there. So these are two-dimensional systems. They are also insulating in the bulk, but if you um, if you uh, apply a hall voltage, uh, then there is a, a hall current uh, flowing. So in other words, the hall conductivity, despite it being an insulator, is non-zero. And in fact, it's universally quantized to an integer times e squared over h. And this comes again, this bulk insulating topological phase with boundary modes. In this case, these are unidirectionally propagating edge modes, as indicated here or seen here in uh, the electronic structure for such a ribbon geometry. So you see the bulk bands and then an edge band going left and one going right. And again, this is an anomalous edge in the sense that any purely one dimensional system would always have uh, left movers and right movers in equal number. So a periodic one dimensional band structure has to look in such that whenever I cut at any Fermi energy, uh, there is, a, you know, an equal number of left and right movers. So this single uh, left mover or right mover found on the edge of a 2D churn insulator is anomalous as well. Here we don't need any symmetry to protect this topology. And I want to go a little bit deeper here and say why this is called topological um, by just considering such a 2D churn insulator and uh, the simplest case where there are two bands, one occupied and one empty band, I want to show what mathematically is behind this topology. It is the so-called churn number. So um, the entire information that's relevant um, to the physics is in this case contained in the occupied band Loch eigenstate. And that depends on the momentum in the 2D Brillouin zone of the system. So this 2D Brillouin zone is a torus, a two torus from which Kx and Ky can be picked. Yeah, they take values between zero and two pi each. And so the Bloch uh, eigenstate is a periodic function of Kx and Ky. And I can parameterize it um, if it's a two band system. Uh, I can parameterize it as a two spinner where the theta and phi angles depend on Kx and Ky. So I can view this um, uh, Bloch eigenstate as a map from the Brillouin zone, to, which is torus, to uh, complex projective space, which is a, uh, equivalent to a sphere yeah, parameterized by these two angles. And now there are two topologically distinct uh, ways of having such a map that I wanted to show here. There are actually infinitely many. Um, one would be I uh, glue on the sphere from the outside this torus. And the second way that I want to show here is I take this sphere, put it in the torus, and kind of blow it up. And you see the difference is that every point on the uh, sphere is the image of two points or an even number of points of the torus here, while here every point on the sphere is the image of an odd number of points uh, on the, of the torus. 
And that is a topological distinction. You cannot um, smoothly change between one and the other situation. And mathematically, you can capture this distinction by the churn number, which is a topological invariant. And this churn number is computed as uh, the curl of a very vector potential uh, connection that's computed so slowly, for, solely from the uh, Bloch eigenstates here. So I contract the derivative and k of the Bloch eigenstate with the Bloch eigenstate, get this vector potential, take the curl, integrate over the Brillouin zone, and then I get an integer valued invariant guaranteed to be integer valued, and it takes different values in these different situations. It also has a physical significance, this topological index, the term number, it's exactly the whole conductivity, uh, which is given by C times E squared over H. Okay, so this churn number only uses uh, bulk uh, information and it predicts whether the open system has these uh, boundary states and what the uh, whole conductivity is. So this is a topological bulk boundary correspondence. The bulk electronic structure predicts what happens when I put the boundary. And uh, so the last thing that I want to discuss uh, about this, uh, you know, uh, topological, conventional topological systems is the phase transition between a 3D topological insulator and a normal topological insulator. And that this phase transition, I can uh, generically expand the Hamiltonian into the form of a 3D Dirac equation, which is written here. And the phase transition is characterized by a sign change in this mass value M. So this is a four by four matrix and these sigmas are the three Pauli matrices. So there's a two by two block here. Now, when M is less than zero, we are, let's say, in the topological phase of this 3D uh, band structure. And if M is larger than zero, we are in the trivial phase. And you see that at uh, the intersection of the two, or at, uh, you know, at the phase transition, we have a massless Dirac Hamiltonian. But this massless Dirac Hamiltonian has a block diagonal structure, and each block is actually um, what's called a vial, um, a vial Hamiltonian or, and, uh, or a vial fermion. K dot sigma, very simple um, uh, effective description of such a system. And uh, the interesting thing is that we can, in a band structure in principle, separate these two vial fermions, which here appear at the same point in momentum space. We can separate them in momentum space. And then we obtain something that's called a vial semimetal. And the vial semimetal is very special because it has a sense of robustness that is not shared by this Dirac point here. The Dirac point is really a critical point that is just happens to be hit by a certain value of M, while these vial points, once they are separated in K-space, are actually stable. And the reason um, for this stability is that whatever perturbation I put, if it's a small perturbation, it cannot lift this degeneracy, the touching, the fact that the vial points are touching uh, points between two bands. I can uh, demonstrate this here uh, simply by expanding the Hamiltonian into the three Pauli matrices, sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, which form for Hermitian Hamiltonians a full basis when I put real coefficients. And now I could, any perturbation that I can add to the Hamiltonian, I can also expand in the same way. And um, then uh, you see, for instance, a perturbation that is proportional to sigma one, M times sigma one, simply shifts the vial point. It does not lift the degeneracy. So the while point initially was at k equal to zero, now it is at k1 equal to minus m. So it is moved in the Brillouin zone, but it's, there's no way to remove it unless I annihilate it with another while point. So another way of viewing this stability of the while points is that uh, topologically they are sources or sinks of Barry flux. Barry flux is the field strength of uh, the Barry curvature that I mentioned before. And so you can view the while point as a monopole of Barry curvature. And now, uh, as in the previous cases, again, there is something anomalous about these type of topological band structures with vial points. And the anomalous feature here is the Fermi arc. Fermi arc is, is, uh, can be uh, seen as follows. So if I have a vial semi-metal, and here I look at the 3D Brillouin zone, it has two vial points, and uh, I want to see what I can learn about the electronic structure when I um, view a different cuts, 2D cuts through this Brillouin zone and the system on these cuts. So on such a cut, um, I have an effectively two-dimensional Hamiltonian, which depends then only on KZ and KY, for instance. 
And on this sheet, the Hamiltonian again has a churn number topological invariant because it's a fully gapped system. The only gapless points are the vial points. And it turns out that since these vial points are uh, sources and things of Barry flux, the churn number changes as you change this sheet from between the vial points to outside of the vial points. So um, that comes with an interesting consequence. These sheets here, of course, have the edge states of uh, churn insulator when I terminate the system in the uh, in the set direction. So when I uh, look at a at a cut between these the projections of these two vial points in the in the surface Brillouin zone, I should have a Fermi point that corresponds to the edge state crossing the uh, Fermi energy. And these Fermi points join into an so-called Fermi arc. While outside of the uh, of these uh, vial points, I don't have any topological boundary states. And these Fermi arcs, again, are anomalous in the sense that they are like an open Fermi surface. In purely two-dimensional lattice regularized systems, every Fermi surface needs to be a closed contour. Here I have a Fermi surface that's an open contour, but the reason why I can have it is because the state, the spectral flow of the state essentially can sink into the bulk to the vial node. All right, so this is something that's also been beautifully observed in experiments and, uh, and well established. And now uh, this is also already uh, the first third of my talk. I've just highlighted a few pics from Hermitian topological systems here uh, again on one uh, slide. So I've talked about 3D topological insulators and 2D churn insulators. And in particular, I want you to uh, remember that the phase transition between a 3D topological insulator and a 2D trivial insulator is closely related to a Dirac or vial semi-metal. So Dirac semi-metal was the thing with mass equal to zero. And then if I add, in fact, the time reversal the breaking perturbation, I can pull these two vial fermions apart and have a locally stable band structure. So this is the general map of how these phases hang together. And now I want to go to the second part of, of my talk and tell you a little bit about uh, non-Hermitian systems. So I want to look at all of these concepts which are well established in Hermitian Hamiltonians and want to see their fate once we add uh, or once we allow for operators that are not Hermitian anymore. Is there a sense of topology and, and what, what happens? Um, maybe you want to first know why am I actually asking this question? Um, well, for one, there are interesting effects mathematically, but there are also several physical motivations to look at such uh, systems. Uh, one could be that uh, if I look at uh, coherent evolution of quantum systems with loss and gain, so open quantum systems, then um, the coherent part of the evolution can be effectively described by a Hamiltonian that does acquire non-Hermitian terms. So the non-Hermitian terms uh, specifically then model the loss and gain, the coherent loss and gain in the system. Another uh, resource for non-hermeticity could be interaction effects. So if I look at the single particle Green's function of a system, and it's actually an interacting system, then in principle, the self-energy can acquire complex contributions. So if I measure the single particle Green's function, or think of it as an observable, then it's actually a non-hermitian um, matrix in general. And of course, uh, aside from that, there are also classical systems in which, um, you know, much of what I said is, is a topology that doesn't rely on quantum physics um, genuinely. And uh, I can also think of lossy uh, classical systems and their description in terms of um, uh, Hamil Hamiltonians or um, response function matrices and so forth. So I'll, I'll have a little bit more to say on that towards the end of the talk. Okay, so that's maybe a physical motivation why we want to look at non-Hermitian systems. Um, practically, from a mathematical point of view, of course, what happens is that the spectrum, which we know and love, and is usually nicely organized along um, a real axis, an energy axis, now can become complex. So we have to start thinking about a complex plane. And uh, so, uh, so when we turn on some non-Hermeticity, you can see here, for instance, point spectrum with, with a few orange dots or a system in the thermodynamic limit. Uh, the spectrum really contains uh, bands, these gray things. They will, uh, you know, blow up into a blob in, in the complex uh, plane. And so 
spectra of uh, non-Hermitian systems could, for instance, look like, uh, like here on the right, uh, containing, for instance, several bands. And there is an important distinction to be made between um, separation of bands via a line gap. So when, it, when I can enclose a thermodynamically large part of the uh, spectrum with a line, or a point gap where instead I have a disk in, this, in the complex plane, which is not touched by any, uh, any eigenvalues. And uh, around it, I have uh, eigenvalues. Yeah? These are two um, cases that we have to distinguish. All right, so now we can ask if I have such band structures, such complex band structures, what about topology? So first question may be, what, are there new topological states? And uh, there are, there's, I'm not gonna even try to give an extensive list. This field of non-hermission uh, uh, topological systems is actually quite mature already. Uh, it's been a lot of work uh, going into it over the last couple of uh, years. Uh, one that I wanna highlight are exceptional points. And of course, the whole topic of this talk, the exceptional topological insulator is an example of a new intrinsically non-hermitian topological phase. We can ask about the fate of hermitian topological phases that we've just learned about. So for instance, the translator, we'll see this stable. And of course we can ask are there new phenomena that we have to uh, take into account when looking at specifically non-hermitian systems. And there's one that's called the skin effect that's uh, notable uh, and important when considering the uh, life boundary correspondence of systems. So as for the exceptional points, um, that is where the name exceptional in my title comes, uh, is related to. Um, so they are basically the analogy of vial points in non-Hermitian systems. So uh, let me rephrase what a vial point was. It's a meeting point of two bands. It appears in three dimensions and is protected against small perturbations, just moves around in this three-dimensional parameter space, which could be three uh, momenta. The exceptional point in non-hermitian systems appears in two-dimensional parameter space. And the reason why it's two-dimensional now is that um, if I have two bands that I want to touch, it means that I have to equate their real and imaginary parts of the eigenvalues. That gives me two conditions. And these two conditions can generically be met in two-dimensional parameter space, like 2D Brewery and so on. So exceptional points are degeneracies of in non-hermitian band structures in 2D meaning two eigenvalues uh, are equal in their real and imaginary part. And um, these exceptional points typically look like this. So you have uh, the real part of the eigenvalues of two bands and they coincide over a stretch here. And uh, the imaginary part also coincides over a stretch, but these, uh, these two uh, branch cuts essentially, they meet only in one point, which is the exceptional point. And an important uh, uh, difference between this and the vial point is that the topology of the vial point, so this Barry flux monopole was inscribed in the eigenstates. Here, I can already see from the eigenvalues that there is an exceptional point. It's simply this sort of winding or half winding of the lower band uh, phase, just from the eigenvalue. Um, let me go down in my list. So uh, what happens to churn insulators when I, um, when I introduce non-hermeticity? Uh, the answer is not, not all that much. They are stable and uh, this is a sound way to uh, think about topology in non-hermitian systems. What happens to the churn bands is simply that they will uh, open as a blob in this, uh, um, uh, in this complex energy plane or complex eigenvalue plane at the edge states will connect these uh, there's going to be a right moving and left moving edge states connecting these two blobs. There's a line gap that's a churn insulator in the non hermitian world. Barry curvature and, and churn numbers, all well defined concepts. You have to be a bit careful with the eigenstates, but I'm not going to go into uh, details here. And lastly, um, so while points are not actually stable, but they can, for instance, become an, um, an, uh, an exceptional line in a, in a non hermitian band structure a line of exceptional points. And the last thing I want to highlight is uh, the so-called skin effect, which tells us that in non-hermitian systems, we have to be very careful when comparing the open boundary and periodic boundary condition uh, spectra of systems. So um, what is, uh, 
what we are used to from the Hermitian case is that when we open the boundary conditions, most of the eigenvalues stay unchanged and we just get a few states that uh, are altered near the, near the boundary of the system. Um, it's fundamentally different in non-Hermitian systems in, uh, in the following sense. So here is an example of a, of a system of the one-dimensional chain that shows this non-Hermitian skin effect. And the key property is that the hopping amplitude toward the left and the right can be different in a non-Hermitian system. Now, this is, of course, by hermeticity, you would require this to be the same uh, in amplitude, but it's not the case here anymore. And uh, a consequence, if you have periodic boundary conditions, of course, every eigenstate has to be completely constant by translational symmetry, um, or can be chosen to be completely constant by translational symmetry of the system. But when open boundary conditions are used, you can see that there's kind of particles are kind of dragged to, to one side of the system. Yeah? There's a pile up of, um, of spectral weight of, of the eigenstates, and this affects all eigenstates of the system. It's not a specific property of topological edge state or so. All eigenstates of the system are localized on one side um, in such a skin effect system. And um, in fact, this can also not only change the eigenstate properties, but also dramatically the spectrum. So here is a typical periodic boundary condition spectrum of a system with a skin effect. When you open the boundary conditions, this loop collapses to a single line. And you can predict this in this case from a one-dimensional type of winding number invariant that I wrote down here. Yeah. All right, so now um, I am done with the second part of my talk. I showed you a few uh, uh, ideas from non-Hermitian uh, topological event uh, structures. So I told you about exceptional points, the skin effect. I told you that the churn insulators are still stable. And uh, now would be uh, the time where I come to the last part of my talk and uh, talk about these three dimensional topological insulators. But uh, before doing so, maybe it's a good point to quickly ask whether there are questions, whether anything was not clear um, about what I, what I just mentioned. If that's not the case, even the more. We have, have oh, there. One, yeah. from Xiaomi. I unmute you, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so uh, I have a just very basic question. So uh, the churn number only exists in, in the even dimension space and the winding number is only well-defined in the odd number. So why, mm -hmm. I, I don't know, do you know some like the, like mathematics from topological mathematics, the why, what's the link between them? What's the, um, the connection or the, is there any similarities or why I couldn't have a churn number in all dimension or, mm -hmm. yeah. Just, yeah, so just, the, uh, right. Mm -hmm. So the way one writes the churn number invariant, so you can argue from, um, what type of uh, invariance you can write down from the Barry curvature and, uh, and ask about gauge invariance. And you will see that if you want a gauge invariant expression that you compute just from Barry curvature, you really end up with, uh, uh, with even dimensional uh, uh, objects. The winding number that I presented here is um, also slightly different, well, it's not to be confused with the winding number of um, uh, one-dimensional the, the one-dimensional topological systems, which also have winding numbers in the Hermitian domain, and there, for instance, it would be the um, the integral of a uh, directly of the um, uh, of the Barry connection, and um, the the this one is not gauge invariant, obviously. Yeah, if you change a, then there could be a pick up through a large gauge transformation, a, a shift in your invariant, but um, a non-integer part of this invariant can be gauge invariant. So it depends on the symmetries when and such a thing is still well defined. The thing that connects the two is the Taoist pumping. So if you go and ex instead of 
you know, if you have one dimensional system and you do a periodic uh, pump, then you can, you can describe this uh, pump by a churn number. And uh, you see that the pump changes the winding number in the, in the cycle. Well, this is a way to connect. That's maybe the, the um, Taulis, Taulis pumping is the uh, word that you're looking for. Okay, so generally speaking, so churn number is um, gauge invariant, but winding number is not necessarily gauge invariant, but could be in some certain case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. and the connection between them is the Thales bounding. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. thank you, thank you. Yes. All right. Um, I don't see any other hands, so let me continue um, with uh, the exceptional, explaining you what exceptional topological insulators are. And the way to approach it is to think again about the anomalies that I introduced before. So I want to ask, you know, what kind of anomalies can I expect in a three-dimensional system that is non-Hermitian? And uh, the first one that comes to mind is that exceptional point that I just talked about, of course, um, uh, if I would um, sort of go and look at the two-dimensional band structure, this thing uh, that, that I sketch here cannot be periodically uh, continued in a, in a 2D Breuin zone. I have to have exceptional points in pairs. So if I find a system which has a single exceptional point on the surface, that's anomalous. That uh, must be some sort of topological uh, feature. Another, um, another one of these system or of these uh, potentially anomalous things are Fermi points. So again, if I have a two-dimensional system, which is, uh, you know, some sort of map of the Brillouin zone, which is a torus to the complex plane, you see that every point on the, of the torus has to land, sorry, every um, point on the complex plane has to land on an even number of points on the torus. So if I define one of these points as the Fermi point or Fermi uh, complex energy that I'm interested in, these Fermi points would always come in pairs. Uh, you know, a single Fermi point would be, for instance, if I have a sheet, a single sheet, um, and, and then you can see that the image of one point of this sheet on the complex plane that could really be non-degenerate, but such a sheet always has a boundary, so it's not com um, compatible with uh, being co coming uh, as an image on the 2D previewing zone. But I can ask, can I have a single Fermi point, a single sheet on the surface of a 3D system? And so that these things are, um, you know, anomalous that has been pointed out in this uh, beautiful work here on the non-Hermitian fermion doubling theorem. So it's, it's clear that if we find a system with a single exceptional point or a single Fermi point on the surface, this must be anomalous. And uh, the exceptional topological insulator is exactly an example for, for that. So um, I want to now basically be very concrete, just show you a model that would yield such anomalous non-Hermitian surface states. And the model is starting from a 3D topological insulator, so a very well-known phase of matter. So this here is a Hamiltonian for a 3D uh, TI. You can think of it as um, being written in a orbital space um, and spin space, so these tau matrices act on orbital space, this sigma matrices act on spin of, of some electronic degrees of freedom, so it's a four-band model. And um, if this, this m is basically the only parameter that's relevant here, this lambda is related to spin orbit coupling, and, um, and the m, uh, if you tune it to, to three, you get the phase transition between the trivial and the topological system, and this is the Dirac, uh, type dispersion that I mentioned before. If you tune to uh, m below, uh, to between, below three, uh, between one, uh, zero and three, for instance, I think, or one and three, then you get um, a topological insulator band structure with this surface Dirac cone. Okay, so this is my starting point. This is, of course, still Hermitian. Then what I want to add is a small magnetic field. It really doesn't need to be very big, and I'll explain the role of this magnetic field in a little bit. So it's a Siemens field that couples to the spin. I can choose it in some direction. And it also has here a structure that uh, basically incorporates the possibility that the G factor of the two orbitals is different. So if this 
parameter alpha is is uh, pi over two, then uh, the B field is completely ignorant about uh, whether it acts on orbital uh, S or P. But if this uh, alpha is, is uh, you know gets a contribution different from pi half, so if this term is switched on, then there could be a difference in the um, G factor. So very physical thing. And then last not least, I of course have to add a non-hermitian term to the model, otherwise it will never be a you know, non-hermitian topological state of matter. And the non-hermitian term that I choose to add is this constant matrix tau x times sigma zero times some complex number. I'll not um, uh, justify it at this point. We'll do that at the end uh, quickly, uh, how such a term could arise. But uh, I've just want to no, uh, make you notice that uh, this doesn't depend on the spin. So it's uh, physically maybe not completely uh, uh, impossible to generate. Yeah? So just an orbital uh, dependent um, non-hermitian term. OK, and so now what I want to look at is what is the spectrum of this system with periodic boundary conditions with open boundary conditions. So first of all, if I switch on this delta, um, the spectrum, of course, it gets an imaginary part. And you see uh, in blue are the bands. And in these different colors, these are all point gaps. So there, there's a wealth of point gaps opening. And in particular, when I start from this Dirac situation, I have a point gap uh, here at, at zero, around zero energy or eigenvalue. And this is kind of the one that we mostly will focus on. And um, we can characterize these point gaps by topological by a topological invariant. This is written here. It's also this type of winding number, but now evaluated for a three D system. So we have a kind of um, the derivative of the Hamiltonian, and then we multiply it by its inverse, and we can take this derivative in the x, y, and z direction. And so the product of these operators taking the trace and integrating over all of um, space is like a, a, a 3D winding number of the Hamiltonian in a way. Yeah? This takes only integer values and uh, again color coded all the values um, here and in particular this big point gap has value one. That's the spectrum for periodic boundary conditions of this model. Now this is the spectrum uh, or a sort of uh, zoom in into the spectrum when I use open boundary conditions in one direction, so a slab calculation. And you see that besides the bulk states that we had before, there is a wealth of, um, of surface states appearing. And the fact that these are discrete points is just related to the fact that, um, that I have a lattice uh, on the surface breathing zone that I evaluate. So it's just you know finite number of points that I use. You see there are two situations here, two different surface localized states. The more red the states are, the more surface localized they are, by the way. One is when uh, the magnetic field is completely um, independent of the uh, orbital uh, that it acts on, and one if the magnetic field is such that it acts with opposite sign on the two orbitals, which is kind of an extreme case, admittedly, but you know, just to illustrate. So this looks very different. Let's try to find out what the difference is. And again, I remind you, this is the, just the complex energy or the complex eigenvalue plane. Um, before I, I do that, let me just uh, point out if I used periodic boundary conditions only in one direction, open it in two directions. In this left case, my uh, surface states are localized equally on all four sides of this then, uh, you know, cylinder that I kind of construct while in this right situation they are exponentially localized towards one corner, which is like a surface skin effect kind of um, scenario. Okay, but what are these states? How do I understand them? So the way this is plotted is that I um, went through the surface Brillouin zone and a color and made a, a mesh um, of dots that I color. These are the bigger ones and they are connected by a few dots uh, like so. And the images of these dots um, uh, the eigenvalues corresponding to these dots in the surface breathing zone are also shown here, but as smaller dots. And so what this basically allows you to see is how does the X, how do the axis of the surface breathing zone project into this complex eigenvalue plane. And so on the left hand side, it's projecting in a very irregular pattern. So you can think of this as a kind of a version of a single uh, Fermi sheet or a single band on the surface with a kx plus iky 
kind of dispersion or, or something like that. So it's like a vortex uh, in, in eigenvalue if you, if you were to go around uh, the origin. While on the right hand side, uh, we have something that's a little bit harder to interpret and uh, it becomes clearer if we think of what would be the image of an exceptional point on a lattice. So suppose I have an exceptional point somewhere and I have these, and it of course will never coincide. I mean, it would be completely random if it coincides exactly with one of the uh, sampling points. So now if there's an exceptional point in here, there are two bands um, uh, at, uh, around, I mean, there's two bands around it at every momentum. So each of these black dots will get two um, images in the complex eigenvalue plane. That means I would, uh, out of encircling the exceptional point, I would get eight, uh, eight images, all with different complex phase. And that's exactly what we see. We see these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight points here. So that means that there is an exceptional point. Uh, so the, the pre-image of this point here and the origin of the complex plane is actually an exceptional point on the surface of the system. And I just want to um, highlight that these two extreme situations are actually um, connected to one another. So if I change this alpha parameter in my Hamiltonian, which you know, tells me how the G factor is you know, distributed between the two, um, uh, the two uh, orbitals, then I can basically make exceptional points appear or disappear from the bulk bands. They can merge, they can uh, you know, bounce off each other. So the, the whole point of this picture is just to show this a little difficult, you know, the concrete case is a little bit complicated. It's actually, so there's this exceptional point from here, it merges with another one, these two bounce off each other, go into the, um, in the uh, bulk bands and what's left is the single sheet. You don't need to understand that in all detail. The bottom line is you can interpolate between the single surface sheet and the exceptional point on the surface without a bulk phase transition, just on the surface by changing a little bit the Hamiltonian. All right, there's a third thing um, that I want to tell you about the surface states and that's related to the magnetic field. So um, I said that the magnetic field doesn't need to be particularly large and uh, its role is uh, that of a regularization. Um, if we look at the same model without the magnetic field turned on, just at the phase transition of the Ti plus the non-hermitian term, we find something that we call an infernal point. What we find there in the slab calculation is that the characteristic polynomial has a zero with fourth order, but there are only two linearly independent um, eigenstates at this energy zero in the origin of the complex plane. That means the Hamiltonian is defective. And furthermore, if we look at the dispersion, and that's at k equal to zero, the spectrum, or the characteristic polynomial, the dispersion of these bands that correspond to these eigenstates, they become um, infinitely steep when we increase the number of layers. So there is an uh, two to the n, where n is the number of layers here in this dispersion. And uh, here's also plotted, um, you have to be careful that this is a log scale here on the horizontal axis, so this log of k. Um, so, so this is a really pathological behavior that in a physical system would probably not survive because there's always like an earth magnetic field to, to regularize it. But, uh, but mathematically, it's quite an interesting uh, object. It's, um, it's what we call an in, in, infernal point. Um, I should also mention that a similar um, object has been found in two-band model in this paper. The difference there was that the number of the zero uh, energy states is also growing uh, with the number of layers. So not only are the dispersions becoming steeper, but also the number of states to begin with is, is, uh, is steeper. But this, with a very small magnetic field, actually goes away and, and the band structures that I showed before emerge. Okay, um, to sort of round this off, um, what I want to now uh, show is how we can think of the bulk boundary correspondence of these systems, like in, a, in, in terms, you know, not just observationally, but, uh, but how can we kind of understand it. And um, also on the way there, I want to give you an alternative understanding of the topological invariant that I introduced, so this winding number invariant. And to do that, um, we want to uh, deform the Hamiltonian a little bit. So 
the Hamiltonian that we study is a three-dimensional system with a point gap. And we can, in principle, so in, in the, the Hermitian topological systems, it's quite convenient, often used uh, to flatten the, the bands and to say every positive eigenvalue I projected at eigenvalue one, every negative eigenvalue at minus one. Here we want to do something similar, but of course band flattening in, um, in complex plane means that all the eigenvalues will be pushed to the unit circle. And uh, we have to also sort of um, remove some defective uh, points, but in, in, in any case, what one can basically show is that preserve, by preserving locality, the point gap and topology, we can deform the Hamiltonian into a unitary, point gap Hamiltonian into a unitary, and that means it's equivalent to a collection of um, I of bands or eigenvalues uh, epsilon a of k, uh, which uh, which are quasi energies or which which you know have this uh, feature that they have eigenvalue uh, absolute value one. Yeah. So these are on the unit circle. That would be something that typically also describes, for instance, Floquet systems. So systems which are periodically driven. So there's a nice connection to these. Okay. And now what one can show uh, upon doing this is that the invariant I showed before uh, is given by the Berry curvature f of these bands times the derivative of the eigenvalue in, uh, in k, x, y, z direction. So this, um, I can think of this here, this object as, when I integrate over the Brillouin zone, as counting the quanta of pumped Berry curvature that are pumped around this point gap. So Barry curvature kind of flows around this point gap and it's, in a, it's quantized. And, and the 3D invariant that, that I presented before is just this, um, this pumped Barry curvature. And another way of computing it would be I go to a fixed quasi, ener uh, 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 quasi energy epsilon and uh, compute the churn number. I, I think of this as a Fermi energy of my flow cape problem essentially and compute the churn number of this uh, Fermi surface here in 3D. This churn number is equal, it's, it's, it does depend on epsilon and it is equal to the Berry flux that flows through this sort of flow cape um, Fermi surface. So these are all quite abstract words, but I hope it gives some intuition. Um, having a torus with flux running through it certainly is something that's, that we can grasp, right? All right. So using this intuition of Berry flux going around the point gap, we can actually understand the bulk boundary correspondence. And to do that, uh, I am going to show you now a sequence of cuts through the 3D Brillouin zone, where I just plot um, the spectrum of uh, basically of the system on a 2D, on a 2D slice. So the slice is, is always shown down here. It extends in the Z direction. I just don't plot it. So there's a slice. And I'm going to move the slice across the, um, across the Brillouin zone and show you uh, how the spectrum changes. So this four band system, uh, here you see four bands, but two of them are overlapping. And I also indicate the churn numbers of these complex bands. Now, I'm going to, that's what's on the title slide, if you remember. Now I'm going to uh, sort of basically make different cuts, move this cut. Uh, and the first thing that I notice is that two bands touch here and they actually exchange churn numbers. So I'm, you know, progressively going through the 3D Brillouin zone. They exchange churn numbers and for that reason, they now have boundary states. So it's like this 2D cut corresponds to a churn insulator here and the trivial band sitting here. These have the boundary state at the top and the bottom of my slab. This is open boundary condition um, uh, diagonalization spectrum. Next, what happens if I progressively move my, my slice? These up, upper two bands meet, exchange Barry, uh, exchange Barry curvature and churn number. And now I have a churn number between the right and the lower band. So the, um, the, eigen, the, the edge states also swiped over there. And then finally, the right and the lower band touch and exchange turn numbers, and I'm back to the trivial situation that I started with. So this is really the Barry curvature pump in the complex uh, eigenvalue plane. And you see that there is no uh, escape from covering our point gap here with a single sheet of eigenvalues, which corresponds 
to sort of stroposcopically uh, the different edge states of the churn insulators that I cut. All right, so that's uh, basically the, the last slide that I wanted to present you about this sort of mathematical topological theory of these exceptional topological insulators. If there are experimentalists in the audience which are sort of whose heads already exploded or which are lost, um, the last two or three slides now I want to uh, use to connect this back to reality and give some intuition as to where we might find uh, such systems and such topology. And the first relation that's quite beautiful, I think, is with vile semi-metals. So um, suppose they have a vile semi-metal band structure. I have two vial cones. Uh, this is all real energies. There's nothing non-hermitian yet. But now I add a non-hermeticity in such a way that the eigenstates around one vial cone get a different imaginary part of the eigenvalue than the eigenstates at the, diff at the other vial cone. So the vial cones are going to be pulled apart in complex eigenvalue along the imaginary axis. Then the spectrum of the non-hermitian system that arises out of this vial semi-metal would look like this. And notably, uh, you know that under open boundary conditions, there's a Fermi arc connecting these two vial points. This Fermi arc will be pulled apart along the imaginary axis and it exactly becomes the single surface sheet of our exceptional topological insulator. So this is actually also another way of viewing our model because if I think about non-zero B at exactly the phase transition to the TI, then this is just realizing a vial semi-metal. And if I wanted to look at the spectral function, what I would see in this transition from switching on the non-hermitian part is that um, the uh, initially I have these two vial points and the Fermi arc. Now one of the vial points gets a quite large imaginary part um, of the eigenvalue. So it's, it's a very decaying, very lossy mode. So we will not see that anymore in a say an Arpus experiment. And so we would have a vial semi-metal which appears to have only one vial cone and the Fermi arc is kind of smearing out and fading away uh, from this. It's not a very sharp signature admittedly, but that's how it would this uh, exceptional topological insulator would look in an ARPIS experiment. Um, then how can we motivate this uh, non-hermitian term? Let me just give you two brief ideas. Um, one would be uh, our model with S and P electrons. We could couple it to uh, another uh, F level electron. So it's kind of a condo lattice type model. And if this F level electron has a, uh, uh, large decay rate or is, is, is very smeared out, then um, we would generically write in the self energy a term like this, which is exactly, you know, due to the hopping between the F level and the S and P levels at second order um, uh, perturbation theory, which is exactly the type of term that we would like to have, except this tau zero, sigma zero term, but that's just an overall shift in the spectrum. I don't uh, bother about it. Condition here is that the um, decay rate is larger than the separation between the uh, S and P and the F level. And another option is to say we look at electron phonon coupling. What we need then is uh, electron phonon scattering, which turns S, which scatters between S and P electrons. If that is a dominant um, uh, channel of electron phonon coupling, one can also argue uh, to get a self energy that, that corresponds to such a term. And uh, lastly, uh, so, so far I've been mostly um, talking about actual condensed matter quantum systems. Uh, lastly, I would like to quickly mention that uh, we can also think about metamaterials. Um, so uh, many topological systems over the last couple of years have been realized in classical uh, phononic photonic systems or notably also in electric uh, circuits. And that last domain was also something we've been working on. So just want to you know, highlight that in electric circuits building uh, non-hermeticity is very simple. We just put a resistor, it's dissipating and it's, it's the easiest thing to put in, a, in, a, in an LC, otherwise LC circuit. And so for instance, we realized with a uh, regular arrangement of the circuit elements uh, on a lattice like this, we realized an exceptional point band structure. Here you see a measured band structure. These are ridges between two exceptional points 
And you can see if you encircle the exceptional point, a pi phase shift in the eigenvalue exactly as we would expect it. So these might be platforms to realize these exceptional topological insulators as well. Okay, so this is basically bringing me to the end of my talk. Um, again, in this non-Hermitian topological world, which might build, still be a little bit strange to, to us, I have uh, tried to add, motivate adding a new uh, uh, player, and that's the 3D exceptional topological insulator. Um, to summarize its properties, um, it's uh, again in 3D intrinsically non-Hermitian topological phase. It is characterized by surface states that cover a point gap either in a single sheet or with exceptional points. There is a surface only transition between these two cases. I do not need any symmetries to stabilize the exceptional topological insulator, in particular not like time reversal as in the, in the 3D TI. It can emerge quite generically from a vial semi-metal or a Dirac semi-metal upon adding the right non-Hermitian term. What I didn't highlight so much is that it's also possible in, in two-band models. Um, and of course, also it's very important that the system itself does not have a spectrally collapsing skin effect because otherwise it would just collapse my point gap potentially and I don't see any, um, uh, any of these surface states that I'm after. Okay, allow me to just quickly um, uh, flash a few open questions that arise uh, out of this. So the first is uh, we observed this uh, infernal point, which we only you know, touched upon its mathematical uh, um, foundation, but it's certainly interesting to see how um, uh, fundamental of an object this is uh, when we think about you know, local Hamiltonians in non-Hermitian systems. Then of course, the stability of these uh, exceptional topological insulators are a question that that should be looked at, as well as enhancing them by symmetries, the same way we enhanced uh, topological insulators to be, uh, you know, study topological crystalline insulators. Of course, we should try to find a realization of such a system. And uh, maybe it's also interesting to not only look at the spectrum, but also at the response functions, which might characterize this uh, new topological phase of matter. Okay, with that, uh, I am at the end of my talk. I Thank you very much for your attention and um, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much for the talk, Titus. And now we are having now we are having a virtual applause. Okay, I ask anyone who has a question. Ah, we have a first question already from Ali. I am unmuting you now. Go ahead. Good evening. Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for a very uh, interesting talk. So I have one basic kind of mathematic uh, question. Uh, while dealing with uh, non-Hermitian systems uh, or non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, it could, not necessarily, but it could uh, happen that we are dealing with non-normal matrices or operator. Mm -hmm. And for mathematicians, it's uh, more or less clear that uh, for non-normal matrices, the spectrum, the concept of a spectrum is not uh, that well defined as uh, like uh, Hermitian or unitary or whatever uh, other normal matrices. And the point is if we, uh, for instance, the skin effect itself, which uh, typically shows up in this non-Hermitian stuff is like this because having an infinite system and depending whether it's periodic or uh, in open boundary condition, then the spectrum quite drastically changes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then adding disorder or adding like small perturbation to these systems, how um, they are stable against this disorder. Yeah. This is a kind of, I try to yeah. combine physical and uh, mathematical point of view. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I would say that uh, that's a very rich question and it's basically kind, kind of, I try to content, put it into the stability um, uh, open question in my uh, summary slide here. 
Um, I, um, so it depends. So for, of course we only allow local perturbation. So that's the sort of the physics, um, um, yeah, imposition on the, on the mathematics. Um, so the, uh, the one thing that I can say, uh, I guess, is that if you have a system that does not uh, display a skin effect uh, as such, so I do have um, a, a robust um, you know, area in the uh, complex plane where I have these edge modes exclusively in, under open boundary conditions. Then I think a small perturbation that's local to this Hamiltonian um, that's my intuition. It's not a proof, but it would be maybe nice, some, something nice to prove, should not change this fact. So that would be my hope that there is a physical, uh, that it makes physical sense to study such a system. Um, so if I have a system, so I can definitely write down a Hamiltonian or, you know, a class of Hamiltonians that like, like my model Hamiltonian here, it shows the spectrum that I'm interested in with the properties of the boundary states that I'm interested in. And what I would claim is that a, local, a small local perturbation to this Hamiltonian cannot um, destroy uh, this physics in an open boundary condition setup. That, that would be my claim, um, but it's I don't know, my, some sort of very vague conjecture, maybe something nice to prove. But I, uh, yeah, that would be something that I think is, um, uh, is probably correct. Um, but of course, you are absolutely right that we have to be careful um, about, you know, the boundary conditions changing substantially the nature of the state. So um, if you um, look, for instance, at my uh, uh, eigenstates here, um, these color schemes, um, they are indicating the localization of the eigenstates. And you see that these actually bulk states from their location in the spectrum are rather localized on one of the surfaces. So indeed, there is not a skin effect in our model that in the sense that our gap collapses, but there is a skin effect in the sense that the localization properties of the eigenstates do change dramatically when opening the boundary conditions, also in this model. Uh, so absolutely, absolutely. So that, that's all I can say really. I think it's a quick, quite uh, exciting and open uh, question. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much. You're welcome. Next question from Sebastian Diaz. Hello. Hello. Can you go back to the slide entitled Surface States 2? Absolutely. Um, let me see. Maybe I'm promising too much. Yeah. And let me complete it. Oh, yeah. Thanks. So, uh, a couple of questions. What is happening on the top part, right-hand side? Why do you get this type of uh, seven-fold pattern, I think? I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's eight-fold to be uh, more precise. The okay. reason is that at the center of this eight-fold plaquette um, is the, this, the center of this eight-fold plaquette is an exceptional point. Um, so this is, if you, if you look at the, uh, uh, basically discretized version of an exceptional point band structure. It's, it's just very hard to plot this, right? Because we have um, a dense complex spectrum. And usually if we have a slab spectrum in the, um, uh, in the in a Hermitian system, we can, you know, we have many bands and then we see the surface band and or two or so. And that's, that's still, we can plot it. But now we want a 2D surface preunion zone and a complex spectrum. And that, I mean, we didn't really find a way to, you know, convincingly plot that other than this. So this is basically meant to convince you that an exceptional point band structure, which, you know, the exceptional points being enclosed by four, um, uh, four uh, points on this, on this uh, you know, letters and case space, ends up having this, if you want, it's a two pi disclination of the lattice that appears in the complex plane. Yeah, so the mapping from this regular lattice in the in K space to a lattice uh, 
uh, in the complex plane has a, de a defect at the exceptional point. That's a way to identify exceptional points. So that is that was expected. That's that expected. Was... I mean, it's expected if I look at the exceptional point band structure in two D. That's how it looks. Yeah. Yeah. And mm -hmm. could you briefly uh, remind me about the main message of the figure right below that one, where you have again one, one? exactly. Ah, uh, yeah, this is just, um, so here I have different contours. I didn't really uh, go into much detail. So this, um, uh, this contours correspond to the, the ones that I, I draw here. And uh, basically if I enclose the two um, exceptional points, um, you know, I should get, uh, I guess, 16 fold, um, uh, you know, disclination or like the 16 points. Yeah. So, so, um, okay. So I, I, I'm not, it's probably too much to explain this in all detail, but we've in the appendix, we have a detailed discussion of how you can go and take different paths here in this lattice. And, uh, if there are exception points on these plaquettes, uh, it should match to the path um, in the image, like on in the complex plane. So it's basically just telling you, yeah, we actually observe the collision of two exceptional points that bounce off each other in this way. Yeah. All right, thank you. You're welcome, thanks. Do we have more questions? Maybe then I am going to ask a, I'm going to ask a general question. You brought up in the end this metamaterial implementation tattoos. Do you can you kind of give me a bit more perspective on how challenging this would be? Because here you have these two components of the field and the non-hermitian term. Is that like a insane challenge or it would be it could be done in this like topological electrical circuits, for example? So. Um, so I don't see a fundamental reason why this should not be doable in, uh, in these electrical uh, circuits. Um, the challenge, I guess, is to view them as an actually three-dimensional object because the circuits were perfect for us to, to do the 2D um, exceptional point since the circuit board is a two-dimensional object. But um, if you want to build something that's three-dimensional, and you know, not use completely non-local uh, random connections. You know, you want to stack circuit boards, and and uh, that's just a little bit of a challenge to to make this nice. Um, but um, in terms of putting the terms uh, that we need in the Hamiltonian, I don't see a fundamental um, fundamental like missing component or something. It's, it's in principle, it's all there physically. Okay, great. And if so, you want, you can also uh, these. Um, so uh, Ronnie uh, Tomala and his group, they've also shown that you can um, actually not only use loss, which is the resistor, but you can actually also put gain uh, in these circuits with operational amplifiers. So there's a huge amount of control um, mm -hmm. over what. Okay, awesome. So maybe we will see. We will see exceptional yeah, material yeah, coming. Yeah. Yeah. In the meantime, we have another question from Atri Dutta. I am unmuting you. Go ahead. Hi. So thank you for the talk. So uh, uh, I had a question. These uh, exceptional points or these uh, complex, uh, these non-Hermitian Hamiltonians, they usually arise when you connect probably LEDs, uh, such a, I mean, in an electrical circuit to these metamaterials, right? Uh, for um, example. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's right. So what, absolutely. So in, in um, more precisely, it's not the uh, Hamiltonian necessarily that we think about of the system, but it's more the uh, response function. So if I talk about the band structure here, it's actually the band structure of the complex um, impedance of the, of the circuit, which, you know, I can measure it between any of these nodes and that's why it has a local structure and uh, so that, that's actually the object I'm talking about. One can also talk about the Hamiltonian of the circuit, but you know, that, yeah, that's uh, another one. Okay, so basically my question was that uh, once you connect probably LEDs or something, then you can do transport experiments, right? So 
what kind of insights can we get from probably conducting transport experiments on these kind of materials so i mean for one um the fundamental way we measure in these systems these uh, the, the impedance is by a transport experiment so we literally like put current in one node and then we measure uh, you know uh, voltage on all the other nodes and so forth so that's how we deduce the band structure or get the response function um that's one that's a very naive way of answering your question there is another way uh, and if you ask you know what is how can we use, for, for instance, if we had a piece of material that does that, or an electric circuit that's like a 3D block that does that, what properties would it have? Um, that's something I've, uh, I have less of, I, I don't have a clear answer to that. So there might be very interesting um, effects coming out of this. It might be like a device that I can use for something, but I, I, don't, I don't have any uh, deep insight to offer on that level. All right, thank you. Thanks, thanks for the question. Can I ask a question? It's hard sure. to raise my hand. <laughs> well, you just did, so that's perfect. <laughs> so for the spectral function that you were showing, um, uh, for, the, for the experimental signature, what yeah. controls the, the difference in this uh, imaginary uh, axis? Um, what, what it how it's chosen? Um, or uh, in other words, how does that difference in the imaginary part of the energy, complex energy, depend on delta. So as I introduce delta and start, say, increasing, mm -hmm. I, it also depends on the form of this term. But um, I'm wondering yeah. how they scale or how they depend on it. So this is actually, pro in this model, it's proportional to delta I see. Um, opening up. So one thing that we didn't have in the model, but that appears in the physical realizations of these terms is, again, that uh, it doesn't come as tau x sigma zero, but also tau zero sigma zero. So both of the imaginary parts would move to the same, like would have the same sign. It's just out of causality if you have the Green's function. Um, but uh, other than that, it's it's delta really here. So there is, um, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I mean, I wouldn't, uh, okay, I wouldn't bet too much money on it, but I, I think it's just delta, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. If, if I'm very unlucky, it's delta as well, but yeah. <laughs> And the form has to be met to the, uh, you know, the, the spinners here and there, they might have, for instance, a, a nearly opposite tau x eigenvalue. And then if I put delta times tau x, I'm going to separate them, right? That's kind of what the intuition behind it. Right. Yeah. Okay, so maybe let's finish the discussion part here. Thank you very much again, Titus, for a nice talk. Thanks everyone for attending and for a lovely discussion. If you want to register for the next colloquium, the registration is up. You can just head over to virtualscienceforum.org. And thanks everyone. Have a nice evening and we will see you next time. Thank, Thank you. you very much everyone for joining. Yeah, yeah thank and thanks for having me. Bye. Bye. Bye.